Okay. Coming back to you. Okay, so Kevin, let me go ahead and record it here as well. And then let me introduce myself and then I will introduce you. Welcome everybody. I'm so glad that we are back for another protocol training with Kevin Clark with ACC. We're very thankful to be partnering with ACC and Austin Sister Cities. My name is Christy Bryant. I'm the chair of Austin Sister Cities and our 13 uh, sister city committees. Today we're going to be focusing on, um, let me look at my little list here, Kevin. So we'll be focusing on Australia. Our sister city in Australia is Adelaide. We'll be focusing on the UK. We are sister cities with the borough of Hackney, which is outside of London. Um, with Germany, our sister city is Koblenz. And with France, our sister city is Angers. We are happy that we celebrated the 40th anniversary of our relationship with Adelaide this week. That was on July 11th. And um, thankful for the many opportunities that we have with Sister Cities. If you don't know about Sister Cities or you're interested, please reach out to us and go to Sister Cities, excuse me, austinsistercities.com. And then Kevin, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. If you could introduce yourself and then let's get started. Thank you, Christy. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin Clark. I teach uh, uh, communication studies at Austin Community College. Uh, my background is in both linguistics and critical and cultural studies which is under communication studies. Um, I've traveled a lot. I, re I really like this training. I've been to every European country, but six. You know, I still got some to check off, but it's a, it's a, it's like a, it's the, the six ten split and bowling, they're kind of far apart. So I'll get them to them eventually. Um, yes, so uh, you'll note, of course, this is really two continents, but as we're gonna see, in particular, when we look at the UK, in Australia, a lot of the cultural dimensions are similar, but it can be a problem because when something is very close, but there's still things that are different, we start to take for granted that it will be the same as uh, being American. And we're going to see that's, of course, not quite the case. Um, somewhat with Germany and certainly uh, a different story with France. So how about let's get started, if you would, um, with... Oh, it would be nice if I could advance my screen. There we go. Um, let's take a look at, at a stereotype of an encounter through European culture. If you remember the, the vacation movies, the second one was called European Vacation. And it has Clark Griswold and his family at a, an outdoor cafe in Paris. And it's just about as many stereotypes of the French and of Americans that you can stuff in the one scene. So how about let's take a look. France is world famous for its cuisine, so just about anything's going to be great. You order what you want. Carcone. Ah. Uh, nous voulons commander à la journée, please. Visiblement, votre prof de français devait être complètement nul. Vous ne comprenez pas une brouette de notre langue. Okay. Let's see. Ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, desire a uh, hamburger and fries. Quel accent remarquable. Chicago? Uh, Peut-être Cleveland. Coca-Cola? For the ladies and gents. Deux champagnes américains. Yeah. And oh, votre meilleur vin. Je vais vous apporter de l'eau de vaisselle. Ne sentirez pas la différence. Uh, now you want to see? Sit down, sit down. My femme would like the, the, the mandate. A souffle, fromage. Et moi, I'll have the boil for the bill. The boil. Je parie que votre femme a une paire de lolo. Mm, excellent. Good choice. Excellent day. Uh, brie, the brie. Brie et votre fille. Un petit cul. Just a little brie, yeah. And uh, uh, well, we'll get that later. Merci beaucoup. Va te faire foutre. Okay, just a little bit. And that's about it. Where would you find a waiter like that in the United States? Honey, you speak the language. They're going to be very nice. Just try. We. <laughs> oui. Okay, so of course, what's amusing in particular about that, I think, is that Clark had all good intentions there and uh, just the barest notion of the language. But there's the clash. Each has a stereotype of the other. Um, now, we're in a new realm of 
uh, AI, and uh, with MidJourney, one of the big ones uh, used now, AI generators. This came up when somebody entered what is a stereotype of a Texan. So here we go. It speaks for itself. You can look this up for various states, and we're going to see them for other countries. Now, what it does is simply take descriptors of the state or the country, puts them together, and creates an image, right? It's not, it, it holds no judgment of it. Uh, now, when I've had, we've had visiting Danes in programs at ACC, uh, I'll ask them what's their stereotype of either Texas or America. And in fact, this is what they'll say. They'll say big and proud. This is what, this is what they think of you before they meet you. Um, okay, so today we're going to take a look at uh, London, Koblenz, Angers, and Adelaide. Um, in particular, we're going to look at some fun facts and the particulars of the first getting together with your colleagues in greetings, meetings, dining, and refining. We'll also look at how these play in with Hofstede's cultural dimensions, uh, and we'll see how you can even determine your own cultural dimensions. So let's start with the UK. Well, some fun facts. The first poaches stamp was created in the UK. It was in 1840 and it featured Queen Victoria. And you'll note that in the UK, it is the only country that does not require the name of the country. You will not see UK on a stamp because they were the first. Not unlike in the US, uh, we can use the .com without a two letter um, ending like FR for France or UK for the United Kingdom. Well, <clears throat> London is quite multi, um, is quite diverse, multi-dimensional here, and it's 8 million citizens, which usually is listed as the largest in population, the largest city in Europe. Um, there are more than 300 languages. So clearly, we can look at the generalities of what makes up UK culture, what makes up English culture, further refined to, to London culture, and then, of course, as Christy noted, um, to a, a neighborhood or a, an outlying suburb. <clears throat> well, tea is, the, is by far the most famous drink among Brits. They drink 165 million cups of tea every day, and we only drink 20 times less than that, so about eight, uh, 8 million. I particularly like this. I'm a big tea drinker. You say tea before you can finish the word. There's a teapot on the table, and you're ready to go. All right. Now, this is quite odd. Now, also with Midjourney, someone created what are stereotypes of British men and women? And this is what it came up with. You'll see it gets sort of this country feel on the right, on the left, more of the tweediness, a cup of tea, uh, the, the cap. Um, but again, it is auto generated with AI. And it makes no judgment. It just says this is what if you put stereotypes together, what you get. All right. So let's talk about how you greet in UK. Now, the problem is it is our closest cultural neighbor apart from Canada. And um, we it's easy, it's too easy to take things for granted. If it's 95 percent the same, we might mess up in that last five percent. And of course, our purpose here is to get into the room, is to get into the room so that we can do business, we can meet, we can connect. So you want to get these things right. Okay, the first thing, uh, of course, as most Americans would probably note about the British, that they tend to be more formal. Um, and when Americans assume that our cultures are the same, uh, they can appear unpleasant or rude. Um, you want to shake hands with everyone upon, upon greeting and departing, and that includes children. Um, you shake hands lightly. This is different. In America, that is seen as a weakness. I think it's called a, was it a, a limp fish? Yes, but um, uh, you should do it lightly. Um, still in British, British culture, women extend their hand to men first. This used to be an American custom, but of course is less so. It's simply a matter of everyone shaking everyone else's hand. Uh, you use a title and last name for both men and women, um, unless you're invited by the host or your colleagues to address them by their first name. As usual, as with most cultures that we've covered so far, uh, you assume the formal until asked to take the informal route because you can't really go in the other direction without a good bit of discomfort. Um, body language is a bit different among the British. They're more reserved in distance and style. Uh, for example, 
they prefer more personal space than Americans. And this is very important. Now, one way to look at this is if you look at Europe, if you go from south to north, if you go, say, Greece or Italy, all the way up to, say, Norway or Sweden, uh, by generally, the, the personal distance increases. They've tested it. You can get on an elevator in Sweden. If you stand co too close, they get off on the next floor. Now, since we take this for granted, we have to realize that um, it's that we are a little bit, you might say, south of the UK because they keep a little more distance. The problem is uh, if you stand too close, it makes them uncomfortable. Um, so you want to stay about two and a half feet from a business acquaintance, three feet from strangers, and maybe a foot and a half from friends. Obviously, in the photo here, this could be an issue in the subway where the rules are a little bit different. You do want to avoid PDA or personal displays of affection, <clears throat> such as touching, putting arms over shoulders, and hugging, kissing are for friends and family. So again, better to err on the side of the form. Um, for eye contact, it is okay to make great direct eye contact, but you should look away now and then and never stare. Uh, this is a uh, it's diametrically opposed to right across the English Channel from, say, France, where you're expected to maintain eye contact. Okay, so let's look at attire. Of course, these things are in transition. Uh, cultures around the world, um, especially Western cultures, are tending to get more informal, especially during the pandemic. Uh, the general attire, however, is a bit more formal, and especially in larger cities, and especially London. Uh, men still wear dark suits and ties in business meetings. Um, the tie is important and may show affiliations, for example, to their college or school or the military. And they tend to wear, uh, for casual occasions, it's still sort of a woolly, tweedy sort of mix for casual meetings, but also on the weekends. Women tend to wear suits, dresses, skirts, and blouses, um, also tweedy. Now, one of the changes that may be coming about as it is in the U.S., the tie may be disappearing a bit, but the pocket square becomes important. It also provides an asymmetry. Um, it's hard to know where this is going to go. It depends on how trends go. But again, when in doubt, go formal and wear the tie and the, and the more formal thing. You can always take a jacket off, but if you don't have one, you can't put it on. Okay, so when you meet, um, uh, you have to think about before you get there to meet your colleagues, do you bring a gift? Gift giving is not common in business settings, but it is expected when visiting a home or for a dinner party, much like the US, because in the business setting, um, the, uh, the setup is probably not really done by the host, but in someone's home, of course, there is a host. So you present a small gift, such as flowers, wine, chocolates, or a book, just like in the US, and it is opened on the spot. Some cultures, you do not do that. Uh, and, you know, of course, they're going to express surprise and delight. And, of course, they don't have to use it. For example, wine doesn't have to be used for that dinner. It can be saved for, the, for another occasion, and that's perfectly okay. Um, if it's a big dinner party, you can send flowers in advance. But you do want to avoid white lilies, which symbolize death, because white uh, lilies are often used at funerals. All right, here's just a quick reminder here, just like in the US, um, we tend to go on the don't side on this. When someone says, how do you do? It's rhetorical, there is no answer. You simply say, how do you do? It makes it equal. Americans might say, pleased to meet you, which in French would be, for example, enchanté. Um, but the, the, the issue here is, it sounds polite, but to them, you're, you're making an assumption that it really is a pleasure when it may not be. Uh, the second thing is, of course, make eye contact and don't stare, especially when you shake hands. You should make eye contact at the same time where it looks like someone is engaged in their head with something else. Uh, smile, but not too much. Americans are known for smiling perhaps too much for them. Just fine for us, but too much for them. Um, of course, don't use your left hand unless there's some special occasion. Someone's right hand is holding a box and that sort of thing. Um, you do want to talk about the weather, how far you've traveled, uh, and of course you say certain things uh, like a dinner jacket instead of tuxedo, et cetera. Um, I think you could even get away with smoking jacket. 
Okay. Um, now, in terms of punctuality, this is a big one because regardless of what you have to say and how you want to meet your colleagues, you might mess it up even before you begin because you got there at the wrong time. Of course, the British, again, are more formal this way. Um, there's a vertical chain of command. And meetings always start as planned. Being late is considered rude, really much like in the U.S. for a formal meeting. Um, you want to prepare well in advance with a concrete objective. And uh, you might send copies of, a record, of record agenda items after the meeting. Um, written contracts are seen as binding and oral contracts are not accepted as the final work, much as in the U.S. Uh, we like to see it on paper and so do the British. Um, business cards. Now, this seems to be shifting quite a lot. We've been meeting with our experts from our various um, sister cities. And um, it looks like the business card is in flux right now. Um, but the idea is if you have one, you can give it out. And if you don't have it, you can't. So um, you have more options if you have the card, whether you keep it yourself or hand it out as needed. <clears throat> They are exchanged informally, unlike in Asian cultures where you present it with both hands facing up to the other person. Um, but it is kind of rude if you stick it in your pocket as if it is no better than a gas station receipt. It is good to put it into a card holder. Um, easier to later if you scan it with your phone and you'd like to enter their information in your contacts list. Um, you, in, you give one card per person, um, even if somebody doesn't expect it because it's better they have it when they didn't expect it than when they expect it and you didn't give them one. Oh, of course, some basics. Uh, we got a little image here of a cricket match. Um, business entertaining is usually lunch rather than dinner. It might be in a restaurant or a pub and pub life is a lot more vibrant than bar life in the US. There is more uh, um, opportunities for food. Um, you might even see families go to a pub. Um, and it, sometimes it could be at a sporting event. This gives you a chance to see a sport you probably haven't seen in the U.S. like cricket. Uh, but home entertainment is uh, popular, too. Uh, of course, you don't arrive right on time for such things. You arrive a few minutes late. Uh, Americans do this, too. If it's 7 p.m., you never show up at 7. It's a little bit it's slightly after. You don't want to be the first person there or the last person to leave. Uh, this, uh, the guest of honor is seated at the head of the table uh, or to the right of the host or hostess. That's pretty standard in the U.S. as well. You don't have to worry about where to sit. Someone will be happy to show you. And, uh, and of course, when everyone's served, no one eats until the host says so or before they start eating. And it, and it concludes when they fold their napkin. So everyone begins and ends their meal at the same time. Um, you might want to... Um, serve as a host to someone who's hosted you, uh, but you don't want to outdo them. So you go at their level or lower. If you're unsure, you go lower, and therefore you have understatement rather than extravagance. Table manners are certainly different. Uh, a British person will spot you across a room by the way you eat lunch or dinner, and, uh, and it has to do a lot with how you use your hands and your utensils. Uh, hands, but never elbows, should remain above the table. So your wrist might rest on that edge of the table or where the, you know, and the edge, even if there's a tablecloth. Um, here's the main thing. A lot of people know this about the British. We see a little bit here. You always keep the fork in the left hand. You do not switch over to the right after you cut something. Um, and the tines face down. Um, we don't tend to do that. But there is a shift because of international cultures uh, fed by um, American cultural presence in entertainment. So now a quarter of Britons and as much as a third of British youth use the American cut and switch method where we cut, put the knife down, move the fork to the right hand. But easy enough. All you have to do is watch the other people at the table and see what they do. It's always a compliment to follow their lead just as they may follow your lead in Austin. Uh, you always want to leave a small amount of food on the plate. Um, this one is a, this varies a lot of cultures because some would say if you leave food, it means you don't like it. Others would say if you ate everything, it meant you ate it because you were hungry. Um, perfectly normal to leave a little bit and anything post-depression in the U.S. would be acceptable as well. Uh, when you're done, you leave your utensils in the 
on the clock, the 525 position. Okay, just a quick reminder here. You don't usually tip in Britain, but you can for a big meal. Um, and of course, they're very particular about tea etiquette. Um, you don't touch the side of your cup, the spoon, no, no tinkling sound, right? You stir it, it's just the spoon and it might touch the bottom, but not sides. And you put the spoon at the same level, uh, the same direction as the cup handle, but that's practicality too. So you're not having to touch your spoon to lift your, your teacup. Um, you know, in the interest of time, um, I have a video here to show you how to um, to uh, set up a, uh, a table done by someone um, who is an outsider to Britain. But I think I think we'll skip this for today. Hello there. Um, let's our last part here. Let's talk about refinement in business settings because a lot of of uh, of you meeting and your colleagues are women. And sometimes there's still the ongoing, the fluid issue of how women work in the business world. Well, the UK still runs in an old boy network. Um, let's keep in mind that the issue in Parliament is the House of Lords. Only recently have women been, as they call it, elevated to that position because it was just Lords, it was just men. It's still kind of a formal aspect of British culture that differs quite a bit from American culture. Um, but women in the UK tend to be in managerial positions a lot more often than in the rest of the EU, or I should say the EU, I guess they're not in it now. Um, American women uh, won't have much difficulty conducting business in the UK. And as you know, here's a scene from a quite well-known British sitcom, absolutely fabulous. Uh, uh, don't be insulted if someone calls you sweetie or darling as these can be common. Um, these sort of pet names are particularly common if you go to Wales. Uh, people will call you flower. Um, so uh, avoiding, avoid ask, asking a male counterpart to dinner because it may be misconstrued as a date. So what you do instead is in the day is to go for lunch. There's an easy begin time, end time, and it's in the workday. So there's no implication. So you can still get business done and uh, you could have a more that more informal meeting for lunch and still have a formal, more formal meeting with other colleagues at dinner. Okay, now let's take a look at Hofstadter's cultural dimensions. In brief, if you've joined us before, you may uh, know this. Gerda Hofstadter was a Dutch uh, researcher. He worked for IBM and he realized with IBM locations around the world, that different, the company worked differently in different countries because of their cultural underpinnings. In other words, we're not entirely free actors. We act in part because of the culture that we grew up in. Um, and in fact, he knew this, he talked to an English woman, he is Dutch. So he came up with these six dimensions. Now I show you this one up front with all six because there's not a significant difference between the US and the United Kingdom in terms of uh, these dimensions are not far enough apart. We'll see it differently when we get to France, for example. But if you're also curious about your own, I would like to point out there's a place called IDR Labs where you can take a quick test and it will tell you, you individually, what your cultural dimensions are most like. In other words, those are the things that feel most natural and comfortable to you when you go to a culture. And after all, we're talking about, as we just said, Obviously, Wales and Scotland are quite different than England in some ways, but we're calling it the UK, likewise in the US. Um, if you've traveled around or lived in other parts of the country, uh, I lived in Belgium and I probably felt more Belgian than I did when I lived in Rhode Island because as a southerner in Rhode Island, I really stood out, which was also quite fascinating. And I, I took this test and here's what I came up with. It turns out I'm closest to Norway and it will give you the six dimensions here and uh, show you the chart here, it automatically calculates it. So that could be interesting. Let's we'll say you're not going to Norway, but this comes in handy if you're going to a Germanic country or perhaps a Nordic country uh, more broadly. Uh, this fits well too, probably if you're going to Britain because it's a Germanic, largely a Germanic country. Okay, let's move to Germany if you would. A quick, some quick fun facts. They're still removing 15 bombs a day left from World War II. 
Um, quite interesting. I tell my students this, and I can hardly believe it. Since 2014, there is no tuition for public German universities, and that includes for foreign students. So if you want to do study abroad in Germany, it's free for you too. The issue comes a little different if it's a private university, but it's free. Um, another, teenagers can drink beer at 16 and liquor at 18. Now, you know, in the U.S., it used to be 18 and 21, and now it's all 21. So don't be surprised if you see someone that looks too young to drink having a beer, as long as it's just a beer at 16. All right, now here's another AI generate stereotypes. I know it's a little odd. We're just in the early stages of AI. Again, this is through MidJourney, probably the best AI generated uh, image program. And uh, <clears throat> here are some stereotypes. It gets in the rural nature of Germany and the city nature in Tyrolean and that sort of thing. Okay, handshakes. Germans value order, punctuality, and privacy. Um, they do like community and social justice, but they respect perfectionism. They're very precise. Shake hands with everyone. Um, of course, never shake hands with your hand in your pocket. It's true in the U.S. too, because it seems like you're not being entirely authentic with the person you're meeting. Um, of course, do not hug. Like formalities, again, err on the side of formality. No one is really going to be insulted up front that you're formal because they can ask you to be informal, but you can't do it in the other direction. Um, if you can, greet the highest ranking person first, not unlike the U.S., as long as you know who it is. Um, titles are very big. More than any culture we're looking at today, any other culture, uh, we're going to see that titles are very important. Um, you want to use a title, a last name, and formal pronouns. Remember, in English, we just have you, but in German, they have a lot more. So uh, you use the title and last name until told to use our first name and the familiar do. So you're gonna use Z and do. Uh, you switch the U if you're not sure. Usually someone your same age, same position, it might be informal, but start with the formal until asked to go informal and that shows politeness. Uh, uh, the title doctor can be used for an MD or PhD as in the US though that gets complicated, right? Um, and perhaps the only culture I know of offhand where you can combine titles. So for example, if I, I, I do have a doctorate and I am a professor, I would be Professor Dr. Clark. So you would combine all of these. In fact, here's a, uh, here's a book and a play um, where it is essentially Mr. Doctor, Hair Doctor. Attire. Business attire is formal, understated, and conservative. Again, probably dark clothes, uh, charcoal gray, black, dark blue. Uh, still ties up. They prefer white shirts, not colored shirts. And women similarly wear dark colored suits and white blouse is the equivalent. Um, uh, and this conservative wear is worn all year. Now, if someone says, oh, it's a little warm, takes off the jacket, you can do it too. But you can only take it off if you're wearing one. So that makes it pretty easy. If you don't have it, you can't take it off. Okay, gifts. Um, Gift giving is uncommon among business associates uh, because it is seen as a little bit too, too personal. Um, but uh, if there is a gift given, it's a small quality and expensive gift. It could be a business item with a company logo. And as in the UK, it's opened in the presence of the giver as soon as you give them the gift or they give you a gift. So let's take a look at um, particularly punctuality. Um, business meetings are set up weeks in advance and lateness is rude. Um, despite their formality, they do wanna to get to know you to establish trust before any business deals are set. And they take business um, meetings very seriously. Um, so you wanna avoid hard sell tactics, surprise and levity. So you have to be careful where the direction of the conversation goes. Um, now, as we're recently finding, good business card etiquette is shifting because of a fear of identity fraud. So um, email addresses are exchanged or LinkedIn account information. Okay, just some quick ones here. Be on time, dress smart, professional. These should not be a surprise, really. Uh, of course, you don't eat before your host. Uh, 
I have to tell you, even if I meet with family, I can't eat before everyone starts eating. I think this is a pretty a common American sort of way of doing things too. Um, Germans like a linear, not a circular approach to getting to the point. They don't circle it, they go right to it. And the Americans tend to do that too. We're very linear, it's on a line, not a circle. Um, uh, don't give gifts generally. Okay, now in dining, um, personal and professional lives are kept strictly separate, especially with the younger millennial workforce. Uh, this has been a push in the US. It has not received the same friendly acceptance that it does in Germany or in France or the UK. Uh, business dinners can be in restaurants or paid for by the German host, of course. Um, and everyone must be served before anyone begins eating, like the US. And the waiter will not clear any of the table until um, everyone is done. If it's at someone's house, allow the host to serve you instead of serving yourself. And it's okay at a house. Again, it's the, if after all, it's their house, it's not a restaurant. It's perfectly acceptable and expected that you bring a small gift, like a bottle of wine or a cake. Um, it could be something representing your hometown. Um, I know my own uh, cousin is a, is a high school soccer player, and he just loves Austin FC um, items. Uh, so it, and after all, they're German, so they do play soccer and would appreciate something that would probably be next to impossible to get there. Uh, after all, and that's not very expensive. There are a lot of items with that sort of logo. Um, also, it's been suggested to me that you might be daring and go the opposite of what we think of German food and bring a bottle of hot sauce, maybe Texan or even Austin hot sauce. Uh, you don't discuss business during lunch or dinner. Uh, unless the host initiates it. Lunch is more social, therefore a little more informal. It's more uh, sealed off by, you know, it's the middle of the day, so you're at work, and then you're going back to work. So it's always a little more informal. Um, of course, the order, if you're worried, someone will let you know where to sit, obviously. The male guest of honor is seated to the left of the host, female guest seated to the right. That may be changing. Uh, gender roles don't seem to play in quite as much as they used to. Um, for drinks, you're gonna have two glasses of wine or beer, two glasses of water are served, but schnapps or something like that may occur, may be requested. Um, a toast is done, glass held by the stem, clink your glass with everyone else and take a sip, place the glass back on the table. Okay, utensils. So you've just gone on a trip to the UK, you're American, but you have to think about it again now. How are you going to use your utensils? Again, more strict than in the US. Uh, use a knife and fork for almost everything, including fruit and sandwiches, which to my surprise, I lived in Illinois. Uh, I've seen people eat a pizza with a knife and fork. So even in the US, we know that varies. Um, you don't use a knife to cut dumplings or potatoes because that's implying that they're not cooked enough to simply be um, a cut in half with a fork. Don't use a knife to cut a fish. Uh, uh, there's a special fish knife instead. And when you're done, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's an X pattern on the plate to say you're not finished in case you have to get up, use the restroom, come back, but use the 525 position again if you are finished. That way they'll know what you're up to. Americans don't usually do that, right? We use maybe where we put our napkin. Uh, is it in the seat or on the table to let us know whether we've left, we're done, or we're coming back to our meal. Okay, um, how do women do in business in Germany? Um, women are not generally accepted in positions of high power. Um, there is equality in pay, but still there's a glass ceiling. Um, women from here need to assert their role. The advice given is to stay strong, be strong, give strong answers and be firm. Stand your ground and you'll get the job done. Um, but it is okay for a, a woman, even a foreign woman, to invite a German man to dinner and pay without any implications because of the formality of the culture and formality of a business dining culture. Okay, let's look at uh, Germany's. I've plucked out the ones from Gerda's Hofstadt, Gerda Hofstadt's Culture Dimensions that are particularly different for Germans. Look at the difference here. Uh, Germany is a long-term orientation society. 
they like to deal with links to their past, but dealing with challenges of the present and future. They're very pragmatic. That is, what's true is true dependent on the situation, but they're also adapt. Uh, they adapt traditions easily to changed conditions. They also differ in the indulgence scale. You'll notice it's reversed here. Um, the U.S. tends to be more indulgent. The Ger Germany ranks lower, so they're considered restrained. There is a tendency for cynicism and pessimism. Uh, that's played out in the stereotype of dark German humor. Um, there's also controlled gratification. Um, uh, they don't put much emphasis on leisure time and control the gratification of their desires. We are seen somewhat more hedonistic than they are. Uh, and if they indulge too much, they feel guilty. All right, let's move to France, if you would. Uh, some fun facts. Uh, at least by one uh, survey, uh, Fran the French sleep an average of 8.8 .8 hours a night. And that's a record for the developed world. When by one, at least one standard, Americans get seven and a half hours, which is certainly not bad, but not as high. Um, in terms of broadcast, the French government has mandated that at least 40% of all music played on private radio stations in the country be of French origin. And half of that, so 20%, has to be no more than six months old. That means some updated playlists, certainly, for those stations. All right, one more. Of course, part of the stereotype, it is true. The French do eat snails. In fact, the average person consumes 500 snails a year. If you're trying to track that, to about a snail and a half a day. All right, here are AI-generated images of the French. We get a combination here of city and small town. Uh, and uh, AI seems to particularly take a lot of play with hats and hair. But remember, this is interesting. There's no opinion involved with AI. It's simply taking a flood of stereotypical memes, pulling them together, and creating an image. And of course, it has to include the Eiffel Tower. OK, in France, uh, keep in mind the French cherish their history and culture, but they also like new traditions as long as they're elegant. Now, remember in Germany, as long as it makes sense and it's logical. In France, if it's elegant, this is the big divide between Germanic Europe and Romance Europe, even though they border one another and parts like Alsace-Lorraine have a bit of both. Okay, so what you wanna do is follow the host lead. Um, they, if they see that you're an American, they're probably gonna offer a handshake. As we saw before in, in uh, the UK, you shake hands with everyone with a quick light grip upon arrival and departure. Again, we, we don't do that. We value the firm handshake. This is important. It's a matter even of split seconds. If you're shaking too long, it's seen as aggressive. Um, and you shake hands with a woman as, uh, with women as with men, if you're a man. Now, of course, we can't talk about France without talking about the cheek slash air kiss. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, uh, they vary according to where you are. The general rule of thumb would seem to be the larger the city, the fewer kisses. So Paris, it's two. That's usually the one we see in news and movies. And as you see here, uh, three times the medium sized cities and on the periphery in the country of France, maybe as many as four times, believe it or not. Um, I saw one, I believe it's for, um, is it Corsica where it's five times? I guess they have more time. So in fact, here are some of the regions. Um, uh, by this, Angers would be sort of between Nantes uh, and Paris, and it would imply that it's four times, but I, I kind of don't think so. Uh, but again, you follow someone's lead. If someone else is already doing it, you're not the first person in line, just count the number of kisses and you'll be just fine. Okay, titles. You always want to use a title and last name unless asked to use a first name. Again, err on the side of formality, as in Monsieur Duval, 
and uh, you address people with either Monsieur, Mademoiselle, or Madame, um, even if you don't know the last name. So when you walk into a store, it's probably a small family-run store, and you always say, for example, Bonjour, Monsieur. Um, it's simply polite. In the U.S., we see somebody will say hello, but it's hanging in France. It's hanging. We're waiting for at the end of this of that greeting, which is to recognize that they're there. You're not just saying hello. You're saying hello, sir. Um, well, you can do that in the U.S., but again, that's erring on the side of formality. Now, the issue is we've tended to move to Mr. and Ms. In France, of course, they have Madame and Mademoiselle. Uh, but you use Madame if someone, if a woman is at least 18, um, uh, and, and if they're married. So you can be married, but if you're married at 16, you're Madame. Um, it's tough. You err on the side of Madame, except for servers who are called Mademoiselle. We did that too. We say, excuse me, Miss, the equivalent. Uh, you want to use the doc, the uh, appropriate title, for example, doc, uh, Dr. Five here. Uh, if asked to switch it, for example, it's, it'd be a lot better to call someone doctor when they're mister than if you call them mister when they're doctor. You always want to aim more formal and a higher title. And if you're corrected, they're simply complimented. You can see here on kind of a uh, uh, the beginning of a letter uh, at the top here. Even it's from someone in Britain, I mean, England, Angleterre, but you notice it's Monsieur, it's a Monsieur and Madame Green. There's not even a first name in there. And note that the addressing of a letter is uh, Madame and Monsieur. You, and there's not even a last name on that. Okay, so meetings. French professionals tend to be formal, well-organized and educated. Um, the French are hard workers, but they're not really workaholics like us. They believe in a more clear work-life balance where professional and personal lives are kept separate. Now, if you want a strong sense of that, simply go to, a, if you happen to be, for example, in Paris, uh, go to a cafe. You will never know the, the server's name. Um, they will take your order. They'll bring things. They'll come back, refill, refill glasses. And uh, it is a profession. A man will be a server, his son will be a server, his son a server. And when he's off work, he's off work. It is a completely separate path uh, compared to America. We say, hey, aren't you in my class? Did, did, didn't you used to work down the street? Okay, uh, the French appreciate punctuality. Um, you're usually seated in a conference room in order of rank. Maybe that would happen in the US, at least at the head of the table. Um, so um, it is suggested, though, don't try out your, your high school French um, unless you've been there more or practiced it a lot more. But basic phrases will always win the day. Studies show even if you know 10 words of French, you're going to get a much better experience if it's hello, thank you, please, et cetera. Um, uh, the French tend to like substantive comments. They don't like small talk like Americans do. Um, and uh, you want to present whatever you're talking about clearly and rationally according to an agenda, but without a debate, a hard sell, or a personal conversation. It is a more direct route, not unlike the Germans. Okay, now we're back to business cards again. Um, there are the formal cards here, uh, but again, in France, there is a growing concern over identity theft. So they're more likely to exchange email addresses or simply LinkedIn uh, contact information. It's still the world's biggest business connected um, social media site. Um, but if you do have a business card, it's okay to have it in English only. Make sure to have the address MME, that's Madame right there. So we see, in fact, in this French style, the last name is in full caps and it comes first because it's not Madame Beverly. <laughs> It's Madame Jennings, and her first name happens to be Beverly. In other words, the, fir the first name is the least important, so it comes third. Oh, and you want to give one to everyone, um, even the receptionist or secretary. The more people that have it, the more that need to contact you for something, then it's available if they need it. So some quick uh, reminders. Um, you know, men, shave, wear good quality suits, women, high quality jewelry. Keep your hands on the table, not in your lap. 
um, wine is meant to be social and not a way to get intoxicated. Um, but the other problem is if you drink too fast, someone will quickly fill your glass. They will not fill it if it's not drained. So if you only plan to have one glass of wine, kind of count it down. Yeah. Halfway through the meeting, half the glass is gone. If you go too far beyond that, it will get refilled and you'll forget how many you have because you didn't completely finish one before it's filled. Uh, um, there may be interruption during your presentation, but it's a way of showing interest and in what they have to say. I would say as Southerners, we do that too. Interruptions are fine. In fact, apart from our electronic format here, it would be just fine right now. It's a little tougher when we're in Zoom. Um, be careful with the okay. Uh, it means zero. Of course, in some cultures, in Arab cultures, it means something worse. Um, and tapping the side of your nodes means you're clever. But particularly note the okay symbol. It is the opposite of what you think it is. All right. So dining. Um, of course, it's France. It's dining. It's usually for socializing uh, through business lunches, um, and that's more common because they can be a little less formal and they're bookended, right? Business day, stop for that lunch. Business day continues. Um, local restaurants are popular, but you may also go to um, something more fast food-like, which technically is called a resto vite, or they often call it le fast, though the French Academy doesn't like that. You may go to a burger place. And how nice, because that's recognizing your own, uh, your own culture and introducing the hamburger. Uh, I've had many French hamburgers there, and I got to tell you some were, but I found uh, better than ours. I mean, they really, they're still gourmets, even when it comes to burgers. Okay, male guest honor seated to the left of the host, female to the right, same as in Germany and the UK. Um, you, make, you wait for the host to make a toast, before you do the meal, just like in the US, if there is a toast. Um, here though, you eat everything on your plate at the end of the meal uh, because it is supposed to be a compliment to the chef. All right, utensils, knife and fork again. Uh, uh, you don't use a knife to cut a salad. I'm not, I'm not really sure we even do that actually, uh, right? You, uh, you fold it if you need to. I suppose we get big chunks of lettuce, we would do that. Um, use a knife to cut bread. You would, don't use a knife to cut bread, but instead tear it by hand, especially if it's baguette. It's going to be big and it's not really meant to be uh, sawed with a knife. Um, again, if you're not finished, knife and fork in an X pattern. If you're in the restroom, come back and 525 position for at some point when the server takes the empty plate away. Um, so keep in mind, hands on the table. Um, don't split the bill. Uh, ask to pay it all or have someone else do it. There is no so-called going Dutch. Uh, finally, women, um, they have an increasing role in business, especially in the professions such as law, finance, retail, and human resources. Um, flirting is part of French culture. As we just realized in our recent meeting we had, it is still common. Uh, Men still flirt with women in, in business, um, but the advice given is don't be too sensitive, move to the business. Take it as a compliment. The thing is it opens the door. Um, it doesn't open the bedroom door, it opens the, the conference room door. Uh, uh, women are accepted in management positions more in big cities. So it depends on how big the city is, just like in the US. Um, a woman may invite a man to lunch or dinner and pick up the tab without question. The flirting has limits. In the US, outright flirting might be seen as more directly not business related. In France, it's part of the culture. So a woman asking a man to lunch or dinner is just fine. Okay, now let's look at their uh, cultural dimensions. One that differs quite a lot and um, is pretty vital is in masculinity. Of course, the scale is masculine, feminine. It has nothing to do with being male or female. It has to do with certain traits. France is a more feminine country than the US. Um, they value caring for others and quality of life. They have a really good social health care system, uh, you know, free health care. Um, and it has to do with um, in feminine cultures like France, do you like what you do versus in American culture, masculine culture, wanting to be the best? And in fact, 
you'll often be asked not what do you do as in a career, you'll be asked what do you like, and that could be skiing or going to the beach as much as it is your your career. Uh, France has a famous welfare system, the Social Security system. They have a 35 hour working week. Some has gone down to 32, which is equivalent of four eight hour days, and they get five weeks of holidays per year. Um, one issue though there is that the upper classes tend to score feminine while the working class scores masculine. Um, and this has not been found in any other country. This is a clash of the modern and traditional. Uh, uh, the, it might be argued upper class has more literal mobility to do things differently so they can afford to care for others, whereas the working class has to scramble more for resources. Another one is long-term orientation, links to its past, quite different than the US. It reverses here with France. Um, truth depends on the situation and the French are very adaptable to change conditions. Uh, as an example, changing the hours in the work week, um, we've had 40 hours a week since it was more or less set after World War II with very little flexibility there, though we think we are. The French are actually more flexible in that regard. Another area is power distance. Um, this means that you accept power is distributed unequally. That is certainly not the case in the United States where we see social mobility for everyone. We believe in it at least. Um, power is not only centralized in companies and government, but also geographically. As most highways, if you look at a map, lead to Paris and Angers may feel um, pushed out a little that way as a lot of cities in France do because they're not Paris, um, excuse me. <clears throat> um, there's also more of a hierarchy. French companies tend to have even more hierarchical levels than companies in Germany and the UK. And um, they even have different like director general. They have specific titles that don't exist anywhere else. One extra thing here, Edward T. Hall talked about high and low context cultures. That is, is that what you actually say taken literally, that's low context, or is it inflected by the nonverbals, your tone of voice, your eye contact? Um, if you're in a cab in Germany and you say, it's hot, the cab driver will say, it is a hot day. But in France, if you say it's hot, the implication is you might then turn on the air conditioning. So this can vary a lot in how you communicate. People will read your nonverbals tone of voice, volume of voice, gestures, eye contact. Ladies and gentlemen, it's July 14th. This is French Independence Day, Bastille Day, 1789. So this makes their 234th birthday. Happy birthday, France. All right, one last country here, if you would. We have a few minutes here, uh, is Australia. Just some quick fun facts. The longest fence in the world is in... Um, Australia to keep dingoes on one side. It has the longest golf course, 850 miles long. You can see in the little red rectangle there on various courses. And uh, Aussies drink 1.7 billion liters of beer a year. That's 680 bottles of beer for each adult. That is adult. Yeah, it's not, it's not children, not even 16 year olds. 680, if you're counting, that's about one in three fourths bottles a day. Uh, here is an AI generated image of an Australian and they are concerned that Americans feel that they are called larrikins as a rule against or yabos or rednecks. Of course, that's an old word formation. It's the word boy backwards with a suffix, right? Yabos. Um, but this is a problem in business settings. Um, but also note, if you overlay Australia and the US, uh, they're quite big. And like the US, one city or area varies a lot from another. So as we talk about Adelaide, you know, it's quite far from Sydney or Melbourne, and I've got it covered there, but and to the east or Perth even, which is smaller to the, to the west. And we tend to group it all together. But the issue is, you know, we have, Texas has 2 million more people than Australia as a whole does. So that becomes kind of interesting. You notice Adelaide there actually, the overlay puts it right about Houston. It's kind of interesting. And just an extra fact on that, there is a ranch, the King Ranch in Texas is bigger than the state of Rhode Island, but there's a sheep station 
in Australia that's bigger than Texas. Okay, greetings. It's more relaxed. Uh, you shake hands with everyone. You use Mr., Mrs., and Miss without other titles. Uh, using first names will come fast, but you might want to wait to be invited. And Australians dress like Americans, conservative suits and ties, skirts and blouses, as we see here with President Obama. Uh, they're pragmatic, direct, and profit-driven. Punctuality is important. Show up a little bit early. Somewhat like the US, at least you're sitting in the waiting room outside. The receptionist knows you're there. Uh, that way, maybe it's a hot day like this. Flop sweat and heat sweat don't get confused. You're cool and dry, ready to go. Okay, equality. Okay, here's the difference about Australia as we end our session today. Um, there is still the notion of tall poppy syndrome, which you'll also see in Northern Europe, like in, uh, in Denmark, it's a big thing. It's reminiscent of English overseers. Um, since they're often seen as just a country of convicts, um, uh, they have a real problem with class. They don't like anyone to feel they are above anyone else. That's the tall poppy. If you grow too tall, you'll be cut off at the top. But as pointed out to me, of course, Adelaide is the only, in South Australia, is the only colony not founded by convicts. Because of that, it is a bit more British. This is something you'll have to navigate. Um, the Australians call the Brits whinging palms. In other words, complainers. Um, they are wholeheartedly opposed to sort of the, the, the class divisions and that sort of thing. But it can vary in Adelaide because of its more British tradition. They value work-life balance. They have holidays, they're respected, um, but they wanna know who you are before conducting business. Um, uh, use clear, direct language. Be careful about using jargon or slang. Americans love to hear about Australian slang and try to use it, but if you use it wrong, it's gonna go bad. You also wanna avoid compliments which appear as flattery, and it sounds like you're trying to get away with something. Uh, communication is humorous and to the point at the same time, as pointed out to me, Australians can be serious in their own way. They want to get business done. They're serious about it, but they are also want to be casual. Table banners in brief, uh, formal dinner, show up a bit early, weddings, even more early parties, 30 minutes late, just like in the U.S. They use uh, British table manners with their fork in the left hand, knife in the right hand. Um, uh, they'll often have informal cookouts and the guest is actually expected to clean up, at, help clean up after the meal. Now that speaks to my Southern heart right there. That is a very Southern thing. You may not help the setup or the serving, but you'll help the clean up because the host is exhausted by that. Uh, you can ask in advance, is there something I can bring? And even if they say, oh no, just bring yourself, uh, you certainly can bring wine or other drinks. And uh, of course, Australia is a land of wines. You might pick up a good Australian wine. The host usually pays the bill, but if friends are out, they'll split the bill. Pub, it's a lot easier because you order, you pay as you order. So you pay as you order for your own items. Women make up more and more of the workforce or paid less. Uh, Australia seems to have the, le the least amount of data I've seen for a country in terms of the role of women, but it's probably because of their more informal nature. Um, and in fact, more women have made strides in gaining managerial positions than most other industrialized nations. So if you're a female visitor, you should be just fine. And that concludes presentation for today, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have any questions? I'm sorry, we're right at 1230, but uh, I would love to hear any questions you might have. This was great, Kevin. I appreciate oh, it. Thank you, Christy. And Kelsey, do y'all have any questions? Yeah, um, thank you, Kevin. I thought it was really terrific too. Um, from my view though, I couldn't see any, if you were showing slides, I couldn't see any of them. Um, oh. So I see that it was recording. So hopefully I can, um, hopefully it came through on the recording. Um, I also, um, you mentioned there's some document uh, called the Cultural Dimensions. Is yes. That, um, where can I find that? Yes. So um, 
if you just look up Hofstede, H-O-F-S-T-E-B-E. -E, Hold on again, Hof please. I'm, I missed the first part. H? Yeah, H-O-F-S-T-E-D-E. -E. It's a Dutch name. Okay. And cultural dimensions after it. And there's a lot out there by it. And that IDR Labs actually allows you to, oh, and if you put that in there, you'll find sites where you can put in any country and you can do them comparatively up to four countries. It'll show you the dimensions and how they differ. Cool. Okay. And it's been studied now since the 70s. So a lot of work research has been based in this. Um, some of the dimensions to get renamed, but it's pretty tried and true. And I've only recently found, because um, I'm actually modifying the course to include um, untranslatable words, which often are based in cultural dimensions too. And uh, you can actually find out your own personal dimension because you may be American, but have been influenced by other things. It's, yeah, it's ironic for me because Norway is one of the few European countries I haven't been to. And yet it seems to think I'm Norwegian. That's interesting because I'm sure my neighbor could take the test and get a completely different country. Yeah, that's funny. So it really has a lot to do. This is something students have a problem with when I say you're not completely at free will here. You are a part of your culture. If I may give you an example of that, have you ever been to a party where there's somebody sitting beside you or something and you don't know them? Well, I'm not allowed to talk to them until the host introduces us, introduces us. And it's very uncomfortable if they don't because I can't say anything to them. Because if I do, it's implying I have a rude host, right? Now, I didn't come up with that on my own. That's simply the way I was raised in my own culture. Mm. So this plays out... Um, uh, a lot, and you'll notice, especially as we did, for example, the UK, a very close cultural cousin, actually Australia too. Uh, what's funny is we take it for granted they're like us, and then we go, oops, went too far. It's that last 5% to make all the difference that they do something slightly different. For example, I didn't have time for them here, and you might note this. Um, Australians really don't like if you try to imitate their accent. <laughs> but That's you know what? True. true? Southerners are that way, too, because it sounds like you're making fun of us. Right. Yeah. But I've never heard. Are you saying that um, you all cultures, you're never supposed to say something to anyone that you've not been introduced? Oh, to? I mean, as a, an American or particularly a Southerner. Oh, OK. You know what I mean? Like if it's just people randomly. But let's say uh, there's only one person in the room that knows everyone, the host the host is supposed to introduce the person that's just walked in the room. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, or, or just say three of you are standing around in a, in a bar or something before a show or something. And uh, uh, you're already talking to your friend and then their other friend walks in. You might say hi to the person, but you can't say anything else to the, to the person that knows both of you introduces you to. It's a weird feeling because you realize you're restrained by your culture, not just your own thoughts about it. Hmm. Obviously, we're individuals, but we're so we're more restrained than we think we are. But it also depends on where you've been. I mean, if you've moved around, whether in the U.S. or, or abroad, um, those will modify who you are. But it also lets you know why you may differ from family members. You may have different cultural dimensions individually because of those influences. Right. I was going to say the same thing. I was an army brat. I can introduce, I, I basically in any situation will introduce myself to everybody who's there. So, <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah, I've, I've, you I've had to find come, the common, yeah. I've, oh, I've, sorry, I've, go ahead. Yeah, I've never come across that, but um, I've lived uh, East Coast, Midwest, West Coast. Now I'm in, in um, Texas, so I've lived all over. Well, I've never, yeah, and in, I lived in Florida too, so I have lived in all corners, and uh, the New Mexico. So um, that's like so foreign to me. <laughs> um, well, I think it comes into those things where um, you know that we've seen TV shows, sitcoms do this. It could be the host kind of forgot the other person's name so they can't introduce you. <laughs> so the way around that, by the way, do you know what's recommended? Um, it's like, hey, um, you two have met, haven't you? And then they look at each other and talk and you're like, oh, thank goodness. Or you know their first name, but you can't remember the last name, right? Um, uh, right. But well, that's, that's what you're talking about is maybe the difference between um, a larger American culture versus a regional 
a regional aspect. For example, when I lived in Illinois, somebody called me Kevy instead of Kevin. And I thought, is that an insult? But they do nicknames all the time, just like they say Za and Pop for pizza and Coke. No. They were, it was actually a friendly thing, but I thought they were making fun of my name or something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's the regional difference, but Americans as a whole do that. And uh, Christy, I'm, I think probably you developed that because um, you moved enough that you had to be practical, right? Yeah. Time is short. I, I, better, I wanna know who they are and I can't wait for somebody to introduce us. It's also survival, survival, right? Survival. To, yeah. Survival. Yeah. yeah. So you're from everywhere and nowhere, then, sort of, right? Yep. That's yeah. the name of that book, I think you mentioned too. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I was talking about, uh, yeah, a way to see how somebody sees us is somebody who has been out of their own country and revisits it. So Bill Bryson, he's from Iowa. He went study abroad in Britain and want to go home, married a woman there, became a journalist came back years later, used his mom's car, drove around the US, and it was all new to him. So we got to pull out all the stereotypes. He didn't go to Texas, but he does pull out a lot of the Southern stereotypes when he goes to like Alabama and Mississippi. And it's fun that my favorite thing really is not stereotypes of other people, but they're stereotypes of me. I've always enjoyed that. Yeah. You know, cause uh, well, if I may give you an example, my first trip abroad was in high school is we went to London and Paris. My French teacher was actually French. She married an American. I don't know if I told you this one before. And we were in the airport in DC. And we met this other um, group going to London and Paris. And they were all excited because, you know, it was, it was, by the way, it was my first time on an airplane too. And the, the, a person from Ohio said to me like, where are you guys from? I said, North Carolina. And he went, hmm. He goes, do you have indoor plumbing? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, end the recording. Okay. And then, um, and let me just see if I'm able.